Welcome everybody to the, ooh, it sounds so loud and booming now, <laughs> I like it, I want this all the time. Uh, welcome to the Solar Streamers and Social Influences panel. Today we're going to be talking a little bit more uh, broad spectrum uh, about the state of uh, streaming and where it's advancing and in particular where how audiences are interacting with streaming. Um, so today I'd like to introduce my lovely panel. We have Lauren Hallinan and Roberto Quinn. Uh, Lauren Hallinan, I'll give you a little brief bio and then you can take it from here. Um, Lauren Hallinan has a, a social media following that she built up in China, actually. Uh, she works with the Meet Group. She is an experienced live streamer who has brought her experience out here to the U.S. where she is developing new apps, uh, in particular to, for social streaming experiences. Um, and I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, um, I'm, my name is Lauren Hallinan, and I work for the Meet Group. And the Meet Group is a portfolio of social mobile entertainment apps. And um, our, our main apps are Meet Me, Scout, Tagged, and Lavu. And um, as of this year, we've integrated live streaming into these social networking apps. Um, and we currently have around 125,000 broadcasters across all of our apps. Um, it's user-generated content, so anyone can go on and become a, a live streamer. Um, and uh, it, it's been a pretty crazy year. Um, we now have, um, we, we've grown a 55 million dollar annualized revenue run rate business in from zero to, it, some, from zero to this in about 12 months. Um, and this is all because of live streaming. Um, you know, it's had a, a massive impact on our apps and on the business. Um, and then as he mentioned on a personal side, um, in 2016 and a little bit of 2017, um, I was a professional live streamer on several Chinese live streaming uh, platforms. And um, even though I'm doing less live streaming myself now, I still pay, pay a lot of attention to that um, industry because I think that the, the Chinese live streaming industry when it comes to mobile and user generated content is probably one of the most, if not the most advanced um, in the world, in my opinion. So hopefully I can bring a little bit of a different perspective to the topic. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, and next to Lauren to her left, we have Roberto <coughs> Quinn. He is a formerly of TMZ fame, I'll say. <laughs> uh, an LA-based producer, he has worked with Dancing of the Stars All Access, which is a uh, live streaming kind of complimentary program to Dancing with the Stars, uh, which he was Emmy nominated. Uh, I, had, I had to pimp that out. Anytime I get the opportunity, I will. <laughs> Um, and yes, he's a creative producer uh, for a lot of live streaming shows in particular, uh, which I'll let you divulge on. Uh, go for it. Hi, I'm Roberto Quinn. I started my company, Quinn Social Media Management, about five years ago. I do a lot of digital strategy and social media consulting for uh, different TV shows and celebrities. And uh, yeah, I was a producer for Dancing with the Stars All Access, which is a second screen experience for Dancing with the Stars. Uh, it was the first fully produced uh, digital show for Facebook Live. Uh, and then we also streamed on YouTube and, and uh, multiple platforms. Uh, now I do a little bit of consulting for different TV shows like Lip Sync Battle and uh, American Ninja Warrior. Um, and we, I, we work with so many different social influencers on different projects and different initiatives for these TV shows. And, when they asked me to be a part of the panel, I, I leaped to the chance. I said, yeah, sure. Thank you, Roberta. Uh, and then a little bit about myself. My name is Rob Pinkston. I'm a former actor turned producer. Uh, I also have an Emmy-nominated series that uh, mm -hmm. I get to pimp now. So I'll take every opportunity I can to do it. Um, and yeah, today we, uh, I co-own PNK Creative Collective, which uh, produces content for mobile platforms. So anyways, uh, let's get this discussion started with, um, I guess, I know this is a little, a little obvious, but I think it's, it's good to hear from your perspective. What advantages does live streaming have over, say, standard social posting um, with you know, influencers and the like? Um, well, the, the main thing that jumps out at me um, is that live streaming is the most raw and, and real type of content, social media content out there, you know? And so, um, you know, we can see how close uh, consumers or social media users can develop a, a close relationship with, you know, a normal influencer like somebody on YouTube or Instagram. But the relationship that users form with um, a live streaming host is much, much closer than, than Instagram or YouTube or anything like that because they're getting to interact with the streamer on a 
usually on a daily basis, usually for anywhere from like one to three or four hours, you know, if they watch the whole, the whole live stream. And so the, the relationship that they develop with them um, is, is much deeper than, um, than they do with, say, a YouTube star. They might watch their video once a week, they comment on it, maybe they get a reply back, you know. Um, but it's just not that same level of, of interaction. And, and also with live streaming, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's raw. It's real. Uh, you, you can tell right away if someone is not being authentic. You know, you, you, you have no choice but to be yourself when you're live streaming. Um, you can't edit anything out. And so that makes people also feel much closer to you um, than, than they might if they know that you know, your, your video has been edited and produced and, and you know, everything. So that's, that's what stands out to me. The authenticity. Yeah. yeah. And I think to add to that, Adding a robust social media strategy is important. So not only banking on the live streaming portion, but making sure that you have a social media strategy in place that complements those, those live streams. So that you have content throughout the week. Let's say you stream once a week or twice a week. You have social media content that helps boost that. And it's incredibly important, like she was saying, to create content that tells a story. So I think a lot of live streamers get on and just say, hey, ask me some questions. How's it going? You know, especially with influencers on shows, uh, it's important to have someone that kind of leads that uh, producing side of it to make sure that the live stream isn't just a compilation of Q&A. It's something more that fans can get a lot more out of than just asking questions to someone that they follow. And I guess a follow-up to that, when would you say is an appropriate time to post a live stream versus a, you know, a, the actual singular photo or video post on, say, Instagram? I think it really depends on the brand. Like, depending on when your highest engagement peaks are, I think it's important to do it when you have the biggest window of opportunity. But creating that, con that content for social media, complementing that live stream content, I think that that's you know, depending on the type of content that you are creating. So you want to be able to create that to push to these live streams. So I think you're able to do that all week long and then push to it on the day of your specific live streams. Yeah, I guess because the live stream itself is so finite in yeah. that once it starts, once it ends, that's all you're getting. Exactly. Yeah, so you want to complement yeah. that. Um, in what ways can users and here, you know, producers make live streams more unique? Lauren? Um, well, I mean, so I'm I'm coming from, I guess, the standpoint of um, uh, of a creator, you know, a live streamer, a broadcaster, you know. So I think that um, brands, if they're working with a, a broadcaster, you know, collaborating with them like they would collaborate with any other influencer, you know, they definitely do want to to look for someone that has their own personality and style. Um, and, and just as Roberto was mentioning, there's a lot of live streamers um, that don't, they're very successful, but they um, are very personality driven and a lot of their content is um, very Q&A oriented. Um, and so I think that, uh, especially for brands that are looking to work with live streamers, um, you need to really review their content and see you know, what other activities are they pulling into the stream? Does it seem like they prepare for the stream? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, are they integrating brands and products into their stream so that when you when you work with them, um, it'll seem like a natural fit. You know, if it's somebody that's usually a, a live streamer that you know you can kind of just see the upper part of their body, and it's a lot of Q and A and just talking with their audience. I mean, that's really great. But you want to also see, you know, um, do they ever talk? You know, are they drinking anything? Are they eating anything? Um, what's the background look like? What are they wearing? You know, these are all ways that a live streamer can kind of differentiate themselves and put themselves into into a niche that's going to fit your your brand or product, you know, and obviously even better if they have some kind of hobby or talent that they're doing to really make them stand out from from other live streamers. Because also you know that if they've incorporated this into their stream, that then um, their audience is already prepped and prepared for this type of content, or their audience is used to seeing them, you know, eating something during every stream, or used to seeing them. Um, 
trying on different makeup during every stream. So you just need to be careful with that and, and say, you know, because as I said, there's a lot of popular live streamers who have a lot of viewers, but they really don't have any type of um, really talent. It's all yeah. just personality driven. And I think to add to that, I think it's very important that when you're trying to decide on what influencers to bring on board to um, help promote your brand, that you make sure that it's, it's someone that doesn't need all kinds of direction. So I've worked with all kinds of different influencers. The best ones are the ones that come with ideas and they have things to say. Because there are some that just happen to get internet famous and then expect you to write out a full script, have something completely ready for them, but then you know there are others who come in and they can say you know I'm used to doing this and I you know my fans really like that and we can do it this way so you both bring the ideas to the table and you create content that is more dynamic and valuable for the brand and for them and they're likely to come back and work with you again. And Roberto, um, jumping off of that, do you have any sort of case studies that you could cite, uh, you know, working with Dancing with the Stars um, from a broadcast perspective, trying to spice up your live broadcasts? And your I, will, I will say this. I think it's important to create content that feels authentic. Um, there are a lot of people who think that live streaming needs all the gadgets and gizmos, that you need the fanciest cameras, and the, you need all of these different things. And sometimes it's nice to go straight to basics and say, here's a phone, here's a selfie stick, let's do this. Uh, in the example of like American Ninja Warrior, we had an influencer come through and, um, and I've worked with the hosts as well who get the selfie stick, they're able to kind of showcase their walkthrough through everything from a very personal perspective. And, and you share that a level of intimacy that you don't necessarily get with the camera. Um, speaking to fans and, and, and kind of going into crowds and things, it's a lot less invasive. And you typically get people on the, uh, the chats that are talking about it. In the comments, they're, they're saying, like, I really feel like I'm a part of this. I feel like this is an experience that I'm experiencing with you. Um, and sometimes when it's too overproduced, they can see right through it. Yeah, I, I would I would completely agree with that. That um, when people are watching a live stream, stream, they're watching it. At least our type of live streaming, it's yeah. because they want it to be real. They want a behind the scenes look. And so if it's overproduced, then they feel like they're not getting that behind yeah. the scenes look. And so I think that a lot of times, especially if you're going to work with you know live streamers. Just let them use what they're used to. Let them use their phone. Of course, yes, you definitely, they need to have like a selfie stick or a tripod or something so that the camera's stabilized and that they can get, you know, kind of better images. And, um, you know, you want to you wanna give them everything that they need to, to make it the best quality possible. But I agree that if it's overproduced, um, that, that kind of defeats the, the, the purpose of, of live streaming yeah. in a lot of senses because the, the audience will just, it, it loses that vibe. Yeah. Of, that real vibe. <laughs> and not to say that there's not room for that as well, but I think if you're hiring influencers, you're bringing them on board, you want that authenticity. Um, we mentioned Dancing with the Stars All Access, which was a second screen um, experience for Dancing with the Stars. That was a fully produced live stream show, but it still had the vibe of being very authentic and straight to camera. There, were, there weren't multiple cameras, it was one camera, uh, all the guests kind of shuffled in and squeezed in, there was no movement of the camera, so it was very much like, here's a camera, we're all kind of jumping in, and it felt real. We had produced segments, so once you, like we were talking about before, once you create kind of the layout of what that experience is gonna be, users know what to then expect, and I think there's room for both, it just, you know, you have to look internally and see what's gonna be right for you. Awesome, I think that was really informative. Um, so, okay, jumping off of that, what are some unique ways that you find users or, or brands, for that matter, can connect or engage with audiences during the live streams? Um, wow, you could jump off so many different, different places with that. Um, I mean, I think that there's, there's a couple things that, that come to mind. Um, 
is that if you are working with live streamers, you know, influencers, like we said, um, obviously uh, they are used to being very active in the comments while they're streaming. You know, so um, anything that they do is not merely just going to be. Uh, streaming them doing it, but they're going to be interacting with their audience as they're doing anything and everything. And I think if you can plan into the program that there are a lot of things that will be voted on or chosen by the audience, you know, just from, you know, it's as simple as they look at their phone and they say, if you want me to do this, put an A in the comments. If you want me to do this, put a B in the comments. Whichever looks like more, you do that. You know, audience really loves to be able to kind of like a choose your own adventure style. Mm -hmm. Like they love being able to participate in that way and deciding what you're going to do, what questions you might answer, who you're going to talk to, things like that. So that's a really easy way for, for them to get the audience um, involved. And then if you're going from a, a more technical standpoint, um, a lot of the, uh, I haven't seen it so much with the uh, apps, Western live streaming apps, but um, Chinese live streaming apps, um, many of them have built in uh, features where, for example, you can um, do a, a lucky draw with your audience and the, the audience can click on a button on the screen and maybe they can answer. There's lots of different types. You know, maybe they have to answer a question and if they get it right, they get you know, some free virtual currency or something or they may, maybe get a coupon for a product or you know, there's lots of different overlays that they have within the app that um, you know, or, or um, they'll have a show and then a button will pop up and you can choose like do you think the person's going to fail at the task or are they going to succeed at the task? And you can choose like, you know, you can make your vote um, or um, there's games that will overlay on top of the live stream that you can play while the streamer is also playing it or something like that. You know, there's a variety of um, different technical overlays that they have that, that make it even more interactive with the audience. And I'll add to that saying, you know, I've done uh, a show called live with YouTube Gaming, and I do YouTube Live at E3. And I've used a plethora of tools, but there are two that stand out, Megaphone and Tagboard. Tagboard is my absolute go-to because there's so much you can do with the platform. And they're all sponsorable. So for example, Megaphone, um, you have in live in-show polling. So they did uh, the Talking Dead, and they were asking different questions and said, all right, if you want to make our guests do this, you know, vote now. And you could see the results kind of coming in live, and you have them sponsored by, I don't know, Dasani right. or yeah. whatever. Um, but you have those in-show moments that are sponsorable, and then they pay for the use of that tool for other uh, engagement pieces, which is important. Uh, I think the, the most important part of the whole thing, though, is that you have a, a social media specialist or a digital strategist that can work in conjunction with your production team to be able to kind of set the tone for what those moments are going to be like and bring them on as early as like development stages so that they can help shape the social media portions, which then can be sponsored and kind of help pay for the shows. You were mentioning earlier uh, in our conversation before we stepped up here that uh, you feel like the, the PR team or the social team is really something that gets un, kind of overlooked on, on productions. Absolutely. Like people are willing to spend, I don't know, ridiculous amounts of money on influencers. And then they see a, uh, an increase in engagement and followers for about a week, two weeks if you're lucky, a month. But then they don't have a digital strategist on their side helping supplement that and use that content to their advantage to then create their own custom content for the brand that they're working with or the show that they're working with. So it's kind of in vain if you're hiring an influencer, paying them you know, a ridiculous amount of money, and then on your end, you don't have that continuity and it's incredibly important to have someone on your side who knows the digital landscape and can help you create that content that's going to then make those impressions and that engagement last for you. 
Yeah, because I mean, a lot of these live streaming shows are, are, are long, you know, yeah. and you can easily take that content and then repurpose it, you know, take video clips, take photos, take quotes, all sorts of things, you know, you can think about, you know, it's an hour, two, two hour long mm -hmm. show and how much you can clip out of that and be using for weeks and weeks afterwards, you know, and if you're, if you don't have a plan for that, then it can really go, go wasted. And uh, going back to something you were mentioning earlier, uh, the interactive components to some of your live streaming uh, experiences that you've seen, are, th are these things that are more like an Asian market thing that's potentially going to come here in the future? I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so. I mean, as far as the uh, mobile live streaming, uh, you know, user-generated content type experience, um, I think that the industry is still very nascent here in Western markets, and they're still... Um, I mean, obviously, at least for our apps, you know, we're developing new features all the time. Um, it's, you know, we're coming out with more and more features. Um, but I, I do think that there's a lot of things that have already been proven um, in the Asian markets. Um, and I don't think that they're exclusive to the Asian markets at all. I think they would work just as well with, with Western audiences. Um, so I definitely think it's, um, we consider it, and I consider it, a, a place to turn to get, get lots of ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this next question could potentially relate to your talent or really behind the scenes. What are some pitfalls to avoid? Um, well, I would have to say that at least from my experience, um, you know, if you're looking for talent to uh, work with you on a live stream, that um, it's either best to choose someone who is a live streamer, meaning that that is one of their main types of content that they produce, um, or you look for a, um, say, a YouTuber who frequently live streams. You know, I don't think, I, unfortunately, a lot of places assume that a, a YouTuber, because they make video content, must be a great live streamer. And that's not true at all. You know, we mentioned at the beginning that YouTube is extremely produced. You know, you can film something a million times, you can cut it down, lots of effects, jump cuts, things like that. You know, they've probably scripted it out. You know, it's very different from the skills that you need to be a good live streamer. You know, a, li a good live streamer needs to really be able to uh, think off the cuff. Um, they need to kind of organically go with the flow of the conversation that they see coming in in the chats, but then at the same time they want to get, you know, if you're on a program or something, they still want to be able to get those key points across, right? Or be able to incorporate your brand casually into the conversation while also continuing the chat with their audience, right? So they really need to be like a TV host, except for a TV host that can simultaneously interact with their audience, yeah. right? So it's, it really takes a lot of work kind of in your head, yeah. you know, to be balancing and managing all this. And it's a completely different skill set than being like a, a YouTuber. So I, I think that it's just really important not to assume and shell out a lot of money, say, oh, this is a huge YouTuber, they've yeah. got a million followers, you know, they'll be a great on a live stream because a lot of them just end up freezing on a live stream. Exactly. So that's, that's the biggest pitfall, I think, um, is just to, not to assume that these are the same type of, of content, you know? We've um, been on some live shows yeah. where we've hired influencers who were very good on YouTube and Instagram because they were able to cut those things. But then when we got them an IFB, they were just a deer <laughs> in headlights. And we'd like have to get them to throw back to our host and it was just very awkward. It created some awkward moments. So I think a lot of producers and executive producers are afraid to have that moment to interview influencers. I think they just go by follower count or relevancy, and they don't actually take a meeting beforehand. They email back and forth, and they say, okay, this person seems great. But when you don't see them in person, you don't see how they can interact. Whether or not they can actually hold a conversation. A conversation exactly. <laughs> yeah. Then you end up with some somebody expensive who brings no value to you, and you're stuck. And again, that depends on the type of content you're creating. If you are creating produced videos, then great, then that person I'm sure would work. But if you're doing live, then it's, you should interview beforehand for sure. Because at least to me, I see that one of the benefits and the biggest reasons that a, a brand or a company would choose live streaming over other type of content, like we were saying at the beginning, 
is the is not only the realness but also the engagement that you're able to have with your audience while you're live streaming. I mm -hmm. think it's a waste if you have a live stream and you provide no means of the audience engaging with the live stream. You know, yeah. so um, I think that. Um, you, you really want to look for someone who is very good at engaging an audience in, in real time. You know, maybe they don't have as big of a following, um, especially because some of these live streaming apps are still relatively small, so they might have a smaller audience, but you really want to look at, you know, uh, do they have a lot of the same people coming back every stream? Are they really good at, you know, chatting with their, with their audience? You know, what is the engagement level like versus how many followers they have? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so going off of that, how, how do you approach talent if you find someone online that you want to use? Well, I've done it every which way. So you can often find their information in their Instagram bios or their, um, their websites. Like when you Google them, find their website. Um, a lot of them do have talent uh, managers now. Uh, I had an awkward situation where we wanted, we knew that someone was coming to the show and we wanted them for our live stream, just as a two minute thing coming up, chatting with our uh, fans and, and having this little segment. And it was misinterpreted through, through the talent uh, manager. And they were like, well, we need a script. Will they have a trailer? Do they have hair, hair and makeup? <laughs> Do they have, so there was all this like, this, well, I was expecting getting a writer soon. Like it was just ridiculous. <laughs> um, I think the people with managers, if you have a, an, a pre-existing relationship with the managers, then you can kind of get a better idea of what you're getting, what type of influencer they are. Um, and, and how they are as a, as a host. Cause essentially you do want someone that has that strong hosting capabilities instead of having to rely solely on your host throwing to an influencer for those types of things. Um, but I, I say the best way to, to approach it is looking for that information on their Instagram bio because now any influencer will have that there mm -hmm. ready for you. Are the, are the Hollywood agencies getting involved with live streamers and representing them? Yeah. Yeah? Yep, yep, yep. CAA has a division. Um, WME, I think, has a division as well. So there's a lot of talent uh, reps that are, that are repping streamers, and especially um, in gaming. There are a lot, mm -hmm. a lot of reps to talent there. Do you find that, I mean, outside of the actual gameplay, do you find that the gaming world of streaming is different than, than the rest of the world of streaming? Very different. Yeah. Because I think the gaming world of streaming, people are willing to sit there and watch someone play for hours on end uh, any game, right? Depending on what they're fans of. And on the entertainment portion of it, you people want to see behind the scenes, they want to know what's going on in their lives, they want interviews, they want Q&A portions, and um, while there is a, a huge level of interaction for uh, gaming live streamers, it's a different type of interaction, yeah. I would still argue, though, at least from what I've seen on um, both our apps and, and the Chinese apps, that I mean, I would I used to live stream for hours, and people would still, you know, mm -hmm. I, you know, I might not be doing much, or I would have different segments, but it's not super produced and active all the time, you know, and. Um, Sometimes if I started doing something, people just wanted me to continue chatting with them, you know? So I do think that there is, um, people are surprised, but there is that attention span. In our world of wanting everything instantaneously, there's honestly a lot of people who just want to sit there before they go to bed and stare at their screen and have a conversation with somebody or watch somebody talk about something, you know? Um, it's, it's, it's simple, but it just, they want that, that human connection. They chat with the other people who are in the chat, you know? So I, I think that um, with, with gaming, um, it's a little bit easier because they have a, like a built-in topic and a, and a hobby that they all share. So they have a, you know, a commonality. Um, but so that's kind of going back to, you know, if, you, if you're a live streamer, it's ideal to kind of find a niche where you're often talking about certain topics or bringing certain activities into your stream so that then you start to have that much of a level of engagement with your fans as well because you all have this, these common interests too. And then you'll find that people will want to stay around longer because mm -hmm. you have more in common with them and more that you can talk about with, with them. I mean, you can see the success of like Big Brother After Dark, like the 
24 hour streams of what's going on in the Big Brother house. Like there are so many people that get in there and they they watch it all day. They'll have it on in the background at work and get home and watch it. Like these types of things appeal to different people. And I think the there's a built-in audience for almost everything. And it is important just kind of to, to note that and make sure that you're fulfilling those things for the people that are viewing. And I think a mistake that a lot of um, productions make is the content. We need to get to this, 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 and this, and this point. Okay, but you've hired an influencer. You don't have that, you haven't created that time or those specific times for the influencer to actually engage with the audience. And that's, that's why you have them there. So I think being able to make sure that you have segments where it's specific for engagement and rather than trying to get to, oh, we have to throw this person here, we have to do this, we have to show this clip, we have to do all these other things, making sure to make it a point that, you know, to use the influencer for the reason that they're there. Yeah, I always liken it to, like, um, I mean, a simple example is, like, if you're baking chocolate chip cookies on your live stream, you're not there to, like, show them how to get it done and make the best cookies ever. You're there to treat them like they're in the kitchen with you. You're chatting, you're kind of mixing some stuff up, you're talking to them, you're slowly making the cookies together, and it's just, it's an activity that you're doing you know, while you're sitting in the kitchen with your best friend, you know, you're not there to like put on this professional, this is how I make the best cookies in the world and we're gonna be done in two seconds yeah. and, you know, it's not a cooking show. It's like, uh, you think of it as that casual, man, everything's gonna take like twice as long as it might on a, a normal yeah. produced show because you wanna leave that time in for engagement and, and discussion. And adding to that too, it's important, I work with so many different hosts as well, it's important to, convey that they're not saying, you know, let's see what the people at home are saying. You want, to, you want them to speak directly into camera. Because you're, you're basically doing this, the people that are sitting there watching it from, the, they're watching it from a computer, or they're watching it on their phone, or a tablet or something, but they're very, very close. And they feel removed when someone is saying, oh yeah, those guys that are over there, no, no, it's you. You guys, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Do you do you enjoy this? Do you want to add the you, you know what do you think? Next week should I wear this? What what you know what kind of engagement pieces are here? And make sure that they're speaking directly to camera and directly to the audience. Yeah, and calling out people's names, yeah. user names. If when you're interacting with the chats, you have to say people's names. Like if you don't, you know, if you as soon as you do. They're a fan for life. You Brittany know? 101 you, from North Dakota says yeah. blah, 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 blah. Oh exactly. my God, they read my, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And as a social media <laughs> producer on that end, I see the follow-up tweets where they screen grab and they're like, oh my God, mm -hmm. they just said my name on this show, blah, blah, blah. And you're increasing your engagement then by doing something so simple, like as a call out. Yeah, just going off what you said earlier, I too am a big fan of Big Brother After Dark. I could sit on my sofa watching somebody else sit on their sofa. All day. <laughs> it's the truth, though, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Car Jim Carrey movie. It's very Truman reflexive. Yeah. Well, it's like yeah. The Sims. That's why the <laughs> yeah. people love playing The Sims. Like that's the same kind of concept too. It's strangely addicting. Yes. Um, so, Lauren, I think this is could be really kind of uh, for you, but I think Roberto, you could also speak to this. Um, how are international social media networks and markets different from here in the U.S.? And do you see a shift as these markets are integrating? Yeah, you know, like kind of what I touched on earlier is that I feel, um, at least from my perspective, that um, China and generally Asia, I mean, the, the Korean markets and Japanese markets are more advanced as well when it comes to, um, you know, I'm specifically talking about like mobile user generated content or um, like professional user generated content. Um, and I see that. Um, you know, because <laughs> because of the large workforce and uh, and everything, they're able to turn around new ideas very very quickly. And you know, they'll try something out on the app. If it works, they, they you know they'll keep it. If not, they throw it out. They come up with something new. So, like I said, I feel like they're 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 constantly adding in a lot of uh, new features, um, lots of new ways to interact with people. Um, and I just think that um, the, the the social media industry over there is is very quick to. Um, try out the newest platforms. So, you know, we see a ton of celebs using it. We see a ton of brands using it. Um, you know, there are, again, there are more produced shows. There are just casual streamers. Um, 
but yeah, I think I think that we're going to be seeing more of that coming into into the Western markets as the Western markets start to grow. You know, now more and more people are starting to hear about things like Twitch and our platforms and some of these other live streaming platforms. Um, and so I think that unfortunately it's just developing slower here in, in Western markets. But I definitely think that we'll, they'll be bringing bringing over. Um, yeah. I think as soon as we catch on here, it's, it's going it's, to take off. It's going to take off. I mean, I was a social media producer for BlizzCon, which is a huge gaming conference, um, gaming convention, and I was there uh, last week. And I was working on a show called BlizzCon All Access that had just opened the, their live stream up to the entire world. <laughs> and we had engagement from all kinds of places. Uh, I worked with Tagboard as well, and you can see a heat map of where all the different uh, engagements coming from. We had engagement from like places in Africa, and then in, we had a few Chinese rogue Chinese people who were <laughs> watching through VPN, I guess, yeah. <laughs> and Australia and Russia. It was just incredible, but like large chunks uh, of people, and they're underserved in a lot of these other platforms. So I think. Once we start bringing, I think gaming is the first one to kind of open up because it's universal. You don't need a, a specific language to see how someone's playing a game, right? And esports shows you that too, like with the coverage of esports from ESPN. Like those have um, wider audiences. So I think that there's a lot of room for growth. And in the next, I'd say, five to eight years, we'll see some major changes here to include uh, international audiences. Yeah, and I think that, um, and I, I think you were gonna, you, you might have a question later on, but um, just uh, I, I think that um, a lot of brands, like international and U.S. brands, are using uh, live streaming in markets like China to launch new products, to create regular shows, um, to. Yeah, hold various events. Um, so we, you know, we see these huge international brands who are, have already adopted this as part of their marketing practice in in China and, and other parts of the world. So I think as soon as it, it becomes more of a thing in the West, you know, they've already experimented it and seen its success with it in other markets. And so it'll be a lot easier for them to you know flip a switch and start doing it here um, as well. And um, something else that we see again, in China, sorry, <laughs> um, is just that e-commerce live streaming is a massive, massive industry. And I feel it's something that um, hasn't been explored at all yet in Western markets, um, is the integration of e-commerce platforms with live streaming, um, you know, adding shopping cart buttons um, and you know being able to you know you see whatever somebody's wearing in the live stream you can click on a button and you can see all those items listed out immediately add it to your cart while you're watching the stream and pay for it and buy it and have it be shipping to you while you're still watching the live stream you never have to even leave the page because it's like they, you start to have two images on the page you know one of the item in the shopping cart and the other is the live stream <laughs> you know it's essentially QVC for like a new a new era, you know, for the younger generation, and um, even the top uh, e-commerce platforms in China have their own built-in live streaming platforms. Um, so I think that that's a, a whole new world that um, you know is there's a lot of opportunities for that in in, in the Western markets too. Well, you just set me up for my next question, which is how do we turn these live streams into profit? What you know is it directly through the stream, like you're saying, or is it something surrounding it? Um, so, I, I mean, I think there's a couple of reasons, and it goes back to your motivation for running a live stream in the first place. So, a lot of brands obviously use it for, for kind of what we were talking about for a lot of these other questions, which is more um, brand awareness, growing a relationship with your consumer base, um, things like that. Um, you know, like I said, if you're having a new product launch or some kind of event, that you're, you're letting it reach a broader audience, giving the, like you were saying with this. BlizzCon thing, giving people access to something that they, they wouldn't normally get to attend. Um, so obviously that's not going to be profit right away. But then, um, like I'm saying, you know, in China, a lot of these apps have e-commerce functionalities built right in. So actually there have been, um, I mean, now hundreds and hundreds of case studies of, you know, just incredible sales results from an hour long live stream, you know, especially when you get a, a celebrity hopping on there talking about, uh, for example, there was one um, like a 
Australian, I think it was, milk powder. And uh, he, you know, was a, an Austra uh, a celebrity. He was a dad. He was talking about how he, use, he uses this product for a kid. I mean, they just made, I don't even, I don't know the, the numbers off the top of my head, but the amount of milk powder that they sold, like, in an hour was just millions, like, off the charts, you know, it was like, Sold out, <laughs> um, you know. So we, I mean, there's there's a lot of case studies of live streaming being a, an extremely effective sales sales tool. And then, kind of in between the two of those, is um, using live streams to drive uh, whether it's online traffic or on, offline traffic, but maybe not immediate sales, but sales in the future. Um, you know, and that can be done um, a, like through coupons, um, for example. Um, I was just at an event over the weekend in, in, in Shanghai um, run by the Alibaba, which is the largest uh, e-commerce platform in, in China. And um, they had a, a live streaming event that was uh, several hours long leading up to the kickoff of, a, of their huge sales holiday. And throughout the event, anyone watching, whether they were watching on their TV or watching on their phone, could play interactive games um, with the live stream and they could win coupons that they could use in the sale, that they could use across any store on the entire platform during the sale. So, you know, by doing this, they were getting people to stay on for the entire live stream for the and interact with what was going on on the screen for a chance to win coupons. And I've also seen this done with other brands where you can win the coupon, but it has to be redeemed like in the offline store. So that drives like foot traffic to, to an offline store, things like that. I think to add to the other side of things, like to get your shows paid for, uh, bring in a social producer again when you're, you're having the, the conceptualizing stages of whatever show you're wanting to create. And find a way to get a sponsor that makes sense for your stream. Um, and then there's an unnamed show that had a, a main show and it had a, a separate digital portion. Uh, I had pitched an idea to be able to get sponsorship to be able to keep this show afloat. So the idea was to go from what they were already doing, which was just showing a tweet on screen, which, you know, that's 2007. Like, that's, there's no real engagement with that. It's just to show that we're putting social media on. I had suggested to have an area created that was, you know, 20% of the stage, and you had screens and things and, and things with like uh, tools like Tagboard, where you could show real-time engagement. You could see, um, you know, what people were really talking about, what they wanted to see next, and so you're having them shape your show, and it's as simple as saying. You know, now let's go to the Dove social media lounge to get blah, 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 you know, what people are talking about or what they want to see. And you've mentioned the sponsor, they have the logo, and as you're going through the tweets or um, Instagram or the polls or whatever you're wanting to do for your engagement portion, you have that sponsorship built in. It's natural. It, you, you can add engagement pieces throughout the season, or, or if you're doing just one stream, you can do it throughout your stream, saying, um, you know, tweet us now and receive a, a coupon for, you know, Dove products, 20% off Dove, Dove products. So you're able to then pay for your stream and then also, uh, you know, help make a little bit of profit for them, make sure that they come back for the next one. <laughs> Sorry, I'm investing in milk powder stocks right now. <laughs> um, do you find that there's any sort of off-putting brand incorporation into a stream for, for a viewership? Um, or is I it, think, or is it I all think good? like I was saying before, I think it's um, a matter of how well it's integrated into the, uh, into the content. Um, Particularly in my case, what I'm talking about is if you're collaborating with um, an, an influencer to have them be talking about your product within their, their stream, is you definitely need to find an influencer that, like I said, maybe they, you know, they usually are trying on makeup during their stream, or they always are eating something during their stream, so it's not weird if they're pulling out your Dove chocolate bar and, and eating it during the stream, right? You need to find somebody that naturally already incorporates these products because you, you really don't 
it, unless it's a specifically an e-commerce live stream, um, if it's just a, another live stream, then you don't want to be giving a hard sell. It's more of um, a you know, product placement type style. Um, but if, um, for example, like I said, there, right now these don't really exist here in, in the West, but if it's um, going to be an e-commerce type live stream, then actually what we've seen in China is that the, uh, the audience audiences specifically go to these live streams because they want to learn more about products that they're interested in buying, um, to get more feedback on this product, um, to see what it looks like on a real person, not a Photoshop picture, things like that. So they're very okay with, like they want you to be talking about the product. Um, so in, in, in those cases, it's, it's fine. But I think if, yeah, like I said, if you're gonna be um, working with an influencer, it, it should be a soft sell product placement type thing. And for me, I think for sure having someone that, having it as part of the production makes sense. So there are a lot of shows who are talking about one thing and then they veer off into something completely tangential, gen tangential and they don't have, it, there's no relation between what they're trying to sell and the stream. Mm -hmm. So even if the stream doesn't normally talk about, let's say, auto parts, talking in a, in a, it's more a celebrity driven, make the show celebrities in, auto, in their cars and the, like, what was your first car, like blah, 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 blah. Finding a way to um, integrate it into the, like, the script portion mm -hmm. and into the overall uh, segments so that when the sponsorship moment happens, it's not like completely out of left field. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And then uh, one last question, then I want to open it up to any questions out here. Um, just real quick, any platforms that you see that are emerging? Well, I mean. I know in China you said there were uh, about no, 200 I mean, on yeah, the market now. Yeah. No, I mean, when it comes to Western, I guess I would say like our platforms <laughs> at the Meet Group. Because um, actually, like I said, we have a, a ton of streamers and broadcasters, um, but we've We've kind of been flying under the radar, honestly. I mean, we because we we are our our, um, our products were already developed uh, social media platforms prior to adding live streamers, so we kind of had this huge user base built in. Um, we weren't starting from scratch when we added live streaming in. So, um, but you know, before our our apps, um, yeah, most people didn't hear about them in like the marketing world because they were most, mostly just you know, kind of straight to consumer, social networking, dating type apps. So I would say in the Western market, all <laughs> apps. <laughs> but then of course, you know, obviously Twitch and other, you know, if you're doing gaming, then probably Twitch would be a better option, but yeah. I think I'm seeing, uh, well, a lot of um, shows that I'm consulting with now, they are finding that TikTok is huge for them. Okay. Um, Whereas before, when it was musically, they weren't really adopting it. But now that TikTok is kind of taking off, a lot of their um, focus has been on creating an audience on TikTok, which is really interesting. Even from any genre, really, from like lip sync battle that I'm doing, and then also the gaming world, like the game awards and things like that. Like trying to adopt that. It's interesting. interesting. Um, anybody in the audience have a question? Right here in the front. Thank you. I would just like to know the, the audience age. Do you find that it's only younger people or do you find that there's older people also becoming part of your audience? Uh, there's f Dancing with the Stars, for example, tends to skew a lot older. Uh, we had a lot of younger fans because we had younger celebrities on board, specifically to target that demographic. Um, but we found that the older audience would actually do the research and try and find a way to join the live stream. And we had you know, 60 year olds. Um, there was one 75 year old woman, I think, who would engage with us frequently and send us like even screenshots of the show and you know, say how much she appreciated that you know, the dancers were saying her name, and it was just kind of nice to see. I think it all depends on um, the type of show that's, that's uh, being produced. Um, now, things that t tend to skew younger, 
um, like let's say like Lip Sync Battle will, would be one of those shows. Um, I think those definitely tend to skew younger. Uh, gaming is all over the place. Like you have the 16 year olds who are in there, you know, wanting to talk about Fortnite and, and uh, you know, strategy on there. And then you have like 50 year olds who are, you know, diehard fans of uh, I don't know, League of Legends or whatever. And you see a, a mixture of audiences that are interacting with the live streams, which is really interesting to see. Yeah, I'd say it really just depends on the, the platform. And then if you're working with a specific streamer, the, the streamer themselves, like their, their audience demographic. So, but I mean, I think a lot of, I, I think the probably the largest demographic, um, at least I see, is anywhere from teens to like early mid 30s is probably the largest, you know, especially in that yeah. 20s area, you know, that's a lot of them are using live streaming. Yeah. I, I had a question for uh, Lauren, and, and that is of those uh, apps that the Meet Group has, tagged and so on, uh, which one did you see the most adoption on and why, why uh, in terms of rapid adoption? Um, well, I mean, we, we put live streaming on our, on our main app, Meet Me, the first. Um, and then interestingly enough, honestly, for most of the apps have, if you look at a graph, the, the, the trajectory is extremely similar. You know, it's a, a, you know, a little bit of a slower start in the beginning, and then it kind of clicks with the users, and more and more broadcasters are jumping up. People start getting a hang of it, and then it, it just takes off. So um, honestly, I, I think that the trajectory of all the platforms has been very similar. It's just, um, it depends on what time we put it. You know, we, we, uh, we unrolled the uh, live streaming first on Meet Me, and then once we saw it working there, then uh, uh, unrolled it onto all the other apps. Well, stream for a long time if they find it interesting, but as soon as it starts freezing, they pop right out and go to somebody else's stream. Mm -hmm. When it comes to like us individual streamers on a on a platform, so it's extremely important because as soon as your signal starts getting bad, people are just your viewer numbers are going to drop dramatically. I mean, there's um, so much content out there that like as soon yeah. as they can't see yours, they're like, all right, next, oh, next one. You know, because yeah. there's usually on like platforms like ours, you know, there's it's. There's tons of streamers, and they'll just hop over and look at look at somebody else. So then, in that regard, if you're um, inviting uh, someone to stream on a on a mobile platform, um, like like he was saying, that you need to be very aware of where you want them to go and what the signal is going to be like. Um, you know, I personally got invited to go to some events, and they're like, "Oh yeah, we have this great Wi-Fi." And then I got there, and I don't think they thought that like when you're inviting 10, 15 <laughs> live streamers who are all trying to live stream at the same time, plus you add all the press and everyone else who's trying to like upload videos onto their social media like as whatever's happening, like there's no way I can live stream. Like there's no way. And then I feel guilty as a live streamer because this company's hired me to go attend an event and I can't produce a good mm -hmm. live stream. You know, I'm like, I'm sorry, the viewer numbers were terrible, but not my fault. Your your internet didn't work. It just kept cutting off all the time. So yeah. it's definitely extremely important. Yeah. We have time for one more question. In the back here, I see somebody. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. We have a we have a personal rivalry. It's okay. <laughs> okay, um, awesome panel, guys. Thanks a lot. Uh, question for you, Lauren. You mentioned some of the like the e-commerce streams and integration. Can you name some of those broadcasts or companies that are doing that, just so we can do some due diligence? Yeah, sure. Um, so, like I mentioned, the the two main uh, e-commerce platforms in China. Um, Taobao or Tmall, um, owned by Alibaba. Um, they have a platform called Taobao Live. Um, and then JD.com, which is the other big e-commerce company, um, they also have uh, like JD Live. Um, and those are pretty much integrated into the e-commerce platforms. And then um, many other live streaming platforms in China will also have a partnership with one of these e-commerce platforms. So they'll integrate some of those uh, e-commerce features into the app. Um, so, uh, for example, there's one um, that I was streaming on called Ijerbo, and I can spell that for you. It's Y I Z H I B O, uh, Ijerbo. And um, they work with uh, Taobao and Alibaba, who, even though they have their own live streaming platform, um, they work with Taobao and Alibaba to, to drive traffic to that e commerce site. So, I'd probably start with, start with some of those. Yeah. 
All right, well, thank you guys. Oh, we got one more? Uh, yeah, we got oh, one more. Oh, no. <laughs> You're not getting out of this one. Oh, no. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, actually, what is the most um, innovative way that you've seen gamification of social media as, you know, as a, as a form of engagement, like, you know, whether it's polls or trivia? What's, what's some innovative ways that you've seen it done? I think I, I always strive to make that engagement portion, like, a very pivotal moment in, in the shows that I'm producing. So I would say shifting from like who's going to be interviewed, we have people ready on deck and you're able to actually give fans the ability to see what they want to see, like specifically, not just giving them a choice between one or two things, they're shaping the entire show. So um, I think the best platform for that, for me, has been Megaphone. Uh, it's not incredibly user-friendly, but it, it gives you the ability to see these stats in real time. Uh, we did a pre-show for uh, the YouTube uh, Live, or yeah, YouTube Live, and we basically had a fully produced gaming show, and we had a, about a 10-minute pre-show where it was built in like trivia, so like the same type of trivia that you have, like. Uh, let's say at a sports bar where you can engage in real time, but it was all obviously for gamers, so they were very much into the idea. We had it sponsored uh, by different sponsored sponsors uh, throughout the season, and we really saw people tuning into the show much earlier, so they were then ready as soon as the stream started, and it was just it's fascinating to see. And then we would have um, these poll battles, so we would be able to say, all right, like we have two games that have not been seen by anybody. Vote for this one or this one, and we'll actually do live gameplay in the show. And so people were really interacting with it because they wanted to see, let's say that they were a fan of like RPGs, or if they're a fan of like first person, like they, they would get really involved in that. So I think for me, that's the most innovative is to be able to have the, the viewers control their experience. Yeah, I mean, I think I would echo, I, I think mostly the same is whether it's polling, voting, trivia, um, being able to play a ga game to win a coupon. Um, you know, some apps will have games like built into them, like, um, uh, like Pictionary where you can actually have two live streamers like simultaneously and um, they're seeing through the back end, you know, like a Pictionary word and having to draw. So there's ways to put some of those games um, in or uh, a lot of the, the, the Chinese apps and now Western apps have it too. There's like a, uh, this is more like streamer to streamer, but you could have it so that it's like an audience member to, to streamer thing. Um, you know, you could, um, they have like battles uh, where they can kind of play a different, um, do a challenge with each other and the, the viewers can vote to decide who wins. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much for attending. Uh, I want to thank Aubrey and the team at Streaming Media West for having us and hosting us. This has been fantastic. Uh, I want to thank Lauren and Roberta for coming out here. Thank you guys and we'll see you at the rest of the convention. Yeah.